control these diseases. In this very early stage, we've got to monitor the blood pressure. This patient should be on the number one drug in America for kidney failure or diabetes, ACE inhibitors. This patient should be on an ACE inhibitor. And you know why, because an ACE inhibitor is going to prevent vasoconstriction and an ACE inhibitor is going to prevent fluid volume overload and fluid volume controls blood pressure. This patient needs to be on HCTZ, a diuretic. Let's get rid of water. It controls your blood pressure. Maybe even Lasix, right guys? But usually HCTZ, ACE inhibitor, those are really good medications for this patient. We need to discuss this situation with this patient. Start talking about diet. You ain't gonna have no damn bananas on top of the refrigerator. You ain't about to be buying no orange juice ever no more, no, no ever again. Okay, you're not. You know what you're gonna get up close and personal with? Apples and berries. Not strawberries, because they're high in potassium. You gonna be all up in the apple section of the store. They got about 50 of them. Go find you some berries. Blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, they have away from strawberries. That's what this patient needs to be told. Now, my man got no damn orange juice in her refrigerator if I go over there. Ain't no way in hell. Be like, what is this? Okay, so that's you. Check yourselves before you wreck yourselves. What would they got in the refrigerator? Look at them. Did they buy that scale yet? Because they should have. Once Kitty Fair came out of some doctor's mouth, they should have bought the scale. Go check on your mama's scale. Do they have a scale? It should. The scale, let me help you out with the scale. The scale will prevent almost every admission of pulmonary edema. The scale could prevent 75% of admissions for CHF. The scale could prevent almost every fluid volume overload that occurs. If you just weigh yourself every day, we can prevent so much. I teach you that your patient ought to be just like a new mom. A new mother freshly delivered knows, I can't go home unless I prove to the nurses that I have a car seat. And you guys are so good at what you do. You send me cute little pictures with your patients smiling, holding their scale, because you're so damn good at this. Your patients don't get discharged until the family picking them up show you the scale. And that's where you get the picture. It's adorable. That's how you ought to be. You got to prove to me you have a scale, sweetheart. I'm not letting you out of this place. You're still in jail until your daughter shows me that you have a scale. Daily weights. Why? How much weight is bad in one day? Three pounds. Three pounds. How much is bad in a week? Five. 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 Don't forget, my mama called me. She said, I don't know what's going on. I didn't get all this weight in one day. You told me to call you if I gained more than three pounds. Well, it's four. You know what happened to her? Her pacemaker had stopped working. What would have came two days later? Pulmonary edema or heart failure. Her pacemaker was only two years old. This was the last 10 years. Little malfunction here. Picked up early with daily weights. Daily weights. She didn't need daily weights. While she's smiling at everybody, she needs some daily weights. This is the most important thing. Simple, simple stuff. Okay. All right, now as you look at this lady, we're going to tell her about her smoking. Put your shit down. What does every cigarette do? Vasoconstrict. Going to shut off the blood flow to the kidneys and the heart and everything else. We need her to stop doing pork chop bacon sausage sandwiches, right? We talked about that. And toe to toe. We're going to need her to get herself together, start doing chicken and fish, leave that red meat alone. Pork ain't even in her house. Stop playing. They got them damn turkey sausages. I buy them. They bet. Okay? You'll be all right. You get adjusted. Put them damn ham hocks down. Go get your neck bones. Chicken, chicken necks, okay, it's better, right? Y'all feeling me on this? This is how you gotta talk to your patients because they Sunday, they say turkey necks, chicken necks, whatever, smoke, whatever, I don't give a shit. It's got to be turkey, chicken, fish. They all up close with salmon. Trust me, I'm a really great Sunday dinner cook. I used to cook with all this bullshit. 
I don't buy it no more. I don't even buy it no more. Tastes good as that. Them kids ain't saying shit. They don't even know. They, Ma, we coming home for Thanksgiving. What you making? They don't know. Okay, they ain't thought about what's in there. Oh, mommy's greens. Yeah, I know, baby. I done changed up the game. Mom, they don't even know. Okay, so you want to make sure you teach your patient this. They don't just know this. You teach them. Okay, now make sure you know they gotta lose the weight because they're causing your kidneys to work extra hard. And what's a real appropriate way to do that? Start with portion sizes, walking after meals. Portion control is a big one. Why is you supersizing shit? What's wrong with you? Do you know if you go to China or Japan where I send my daughter over there in China, they don't even have normal sizes. There's no six piece McNugget, they're four. There is no super size nowhere in that country. You need to stop it. We're creating a nightmare here. No super sizes. Stop it. Okay? Now, your patient is now on medications because we're trying to preserve their kidneys forever. And this patient is making sure they don't do anything that could kill the kidneys off. They are going to be told to tell every doctor, dentist, whoever they come in contact with, I can't have nothing. I'm on kidney failure. I don't give me that 800 Motrin. I have kidney failure. They cannot take Motrin. NSAIDs of any kind, Advil, Aleve, none of that. If we do contrast diet, we gotta run a B1 and creatinine first to check it and see if it's appropriate. Isn't that right? So they got a CAT scan contrast. We can't do it unless we run a B1 and a creatinine first. And then if we run it and it's terrible, we're going to have to call somebody because we can't do it. Okay, so these are things you know. So no NSAIDs, no aminoglycosides, no magnesium products, no orange juice. What's the highest potassium food? You think it's strawberries? Shiva, what's the highest potassium food? What's the highest potassium food, uh, Rachel? Mm -hmm. Purple fruit was what you're allowed. What's the that's iron? What was uh, high in potassium, Cynthia? Okay, somebody said that. You want to come again, Sarah? Felicia? Joshua? Dariana, Miss Katie, this is what I get every time I ask this question. Potatoes, potassium, potatoes, potassium. You better figure out and get it in your head. Potatoes, potassium, potatoes, potassium. You're laughing now, your last going to be an inkling going, yeah, she said that shit. Now, P-O-T, P-O-T, potatoes, potassium. Don't nobody ever know that shit. So I gotta dance and sing and shit. Damn shame. Stuff y'all put me through. Okay, now, so for real, for real, for real. Baked potato, bad. Sweet potato, bad. This is all high in potassium. It's the highest food in potassium. You think bananas is on some test? They know you know that shit. That ain't on there. So tomatoes, potatoes. Tomatoes, potatoes. Bananas, okay, yeah, that's cute. Oranges, strawberries, melons. Now listen, don't shoot the messenger. Chocolate. <laughs> Chocolate. Chocolate is high in potassium. Mm -hmm, honey. That's why chocolate milk is the, the drink of choice for athletes. Chocolate milk. Okay? All right, now get your life together. Turn the page, hell. We gotta make our patients sicker. Put at the top, stage three. Chop, chop. Stage three, sister girl, hit. She look like it. Look at her. She got a problem. She don't look happy no more. So here's our deal. Her glomerular filtration rate is less than 60. 
starting to creep all them down. GFR, less than 60 for three months, is called stage three. Now, let me tell you something. This patient still does not qualify for dialysis and shouldn't. But look at the words now. She's no longer in diminished renal reserve. She's hanging out with renal insufficiency. Y'all good? She is at risk right now for a stroke, an MI. She's at risk for infection. Didn't we say that the um, didn't we say that the uh, kidneys metabolize vitamin D? Mm -hmm. Didn't we say that it produces erythropoietin? Mm -hmm. Let's just look at those two. Let's just look at those two, okay? Do you see where it says anemia on the right side? Yes. Well, that's that erythropoietin. So if your kidneys cannot make erythropoietin, then you are going to be anemic because erythropoietin stimulates the bone marrow to make red blood cells. Now you don't make erythropoietin, nobody's stimulating the bone marrow, red blood cells are not being made, you are anemic. What does that mean? Look at her, she's tired. You know this, anemia is exhaustion. She's tired, she's dumped over, right? Things gotta make sense, you don't memorize shit, we gotta understand it. I want you to put on here, I will put it over at the, um, I will put it over at the bottom on the left hand side. Let's examine why she's at more risk for infection, because I don't think that people know that. This patient with this kidney failure, stage three, like my mama, she's at increased risk for infection, because get this, vitamin D helps our body recognize self from non-self. So if we get an infection, that's non-self. The vitamin D helps you recognize it. If I have great blood count and I'm not anemic, I can fight the infection. So when you're anemic, you don't fight infection very well. You knew that, because sickle cell is always at risk for infection. So two things, the vitamin D issue and the anemia issue is gonna make your kidney failure patient at risk for infection. So you know about that. That's why we said in class the other day, flu shot every year. Pneumonia shot every five years. Got to get their vaccines. Flu shot every year. This is the season. October, September, October is the season. And then the pneumonia vaccine every five. This is a very high risk patient. Okay, so you got to you got to worry about that. Now let's look at some more stuff. Let's just go down the list. Hell, everybody in here is not in kindergarten. Most of y'all ready to test. So if you look at a headache, why does she have a headache? High blood pressure. We don't separate those, do we all? We know that anytime you got a high blood pressure, you gonna have a headache. So far so good? So anytime you have a high blood pressure, you're gonna have a headache, that's neuro. All neuro patients have those. Okay, cool. Now, ability to concentrate urine. Well, what's her specific gravity? High or low? Low. She doesn't have any ability to concentrate her urine. All the waste product is still in her body. Don't that make sense? Okay. Keep it moving. This is going to sound really weird. Again, your kidneys are trying to give it the last good shot. So they do polyuria before oliguria. That's weird. You actually give it one more last try. You put out more urine trying to get rid of all this waste. You're like, dang, everything I do, I can't get rid of this waste. Maybe if I pee more, I can get rid of it. See? Don't that make sense? Okay? So, polyuria first, then out of urea. You know the bottom. Look at what it says. Increased BUN, BUN and creatinine. You know that. Because in the blood, it's high. In the urine, it's low. Okay? Go over to the other side, edema. We're now starting to hold on to our water. We're getting edema. GFR, I told you it was 60. You see the high serum K, because you can't get rid of it. Now let's put some more with, with it. Not only do we have a high K, write this down, you have a high phosphorus. 
you have a high uric acid. You have a high B and creatinine. Get your highs together. High potassium, high phosphorus, high uric acid, high B and creatinine. Here's what is low. Low calcium, low albumin. Low H and H because it's dilute. Now we did our highs and our lows. I left a leftover like spaghetti. I want you to tell me the last one. You have to tell me which one it is. Brandy, is the pH of the blood high or low? Tasha, is Brandy right? Yes. Uh, Tysa, is Natasha right? Is Brandy right and Natasha right? They said it's, they said it's gonna be high. Darnita, do you agree? No. Why? They hold on to all the Excellent. There go my nurse. The pH is low because the patient's acidic. They're holding on to uric what? Acid. So they're in acidosis. This is select all. Okay. All right. Now the blood pressure is high. Weak and fatigue. Keep it moving. Oh, wait a minute. Hold up. Look at her little laugh slip. Y'all see it? See her little laugh slip in her hand? She got the hemoglobin. What does it say it is? Uh, oh, okay. Creatinine and BUN high. Mm, okay. Turn. She real pitiful now, y'all. Hot mess. Ooh, wee. Look at her, y'all. She's pitiful. Okay, now this is what I need you to do. I need you to put on the top dialysis occurs with GFR. 15 and below, and the most important word here is and. Dialysis occurs when the GFR is 15 or below, and the most important word here is and. There are positive signs and symptoms. In other words, we don't just go by the lab. So when my dad called me and said his GFR was 19, that qualified him from a, for an organ donor list. I wanted to donate my kidney, he wouldn't have it. I was pissed. So when you hit 20 and below, you go on a donor list. When you hit 15 and below and you have symptoms, now you go on dialysis. So my dad really did not have any symptoms, I told you that. And he really just kind of was clueless about the whole thing. So they said, well, we don't want to do dialysis even though you're running around 15. And he did get to 15. But we don't want to do it now because you still feel really good. And you know why. Once we start the nightmare, we can't stop it. And once we start, your freedoms are impacted. You just don't have the freedoms that you did. Remember, he's a world traveler. So he just doesn't have that ability because you kind of got to stay a little bit put, right? You got to do this shit three times a week or if you're going to do peritoneal dialysis at the house or whatever. You're kind of tied to a machine or something, right? You agree? So we're not trying to start it until we have to. But yet, we don't want to wait until you're beyond recognition with your symptoms because why? We've got to make sure we place a shunt. We've got to do a fistula, right? So either arterial venous shunt or AV fistula has got to be placed or a peritoneal dialysis port, isn't that right? Those take weeks to mature. You've got to put them in way in advance is what you better know because they got to get real tough, strong. There's got to be scar tissue building up on purpose. We want that either in your peritoneal dialysis port or your AV fistula. We want it strong. It's got to accommodate a lot of blood, so we want it strong, okay? So we put it in in advance, weeks in advance. You can't just do it tomorrow, no. 
So my dad, you know, he had it in January to start dialysis to like June or something or whatever. Okay, so we're gonna be a little while waiting on it to mature. It's called mature, okay? So you did have to know that about this lady. Now, we got some rules, oh my God, we got some rules, y'all. We want for this patient to always have a brewing and a thrill. How do nurses listen for the brewing? Louder. The bell of your stethoscope. You better know that. B for bell, B for brewing. So far so good? You're listening with the bell of your stethoscope. B for bell, B for brewing. Okay? This is what you're going to teach your patients because the brewing is a nursing issue, isn't it? But you're going to teach, 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 keeps people out of the hospital. You're going to teach your patient that when they wake up every single freaking morning, they're going to take their hand and they're going to put it on that AV fistula or shunt and they're going to feel for the thrill. Now, I teach them because I like comedy and humor. I said, now listen, if the thrill is gone, it's an OMG emergency, right? You gotta teach like that. They'll remember it better. If the thrill is gone, it's an OMG emergency. It is an emergency because it's not working. It means it clotted off. It means I can't do dialysis. It means that your potassium is gonna go up. It means that fluid volume overload is coming. It means that pulmonary edema is close by. Know it. If the thrill is gone, OMG emergency. That's how you gotta look at that. Brewies and thrills, gotta have them. Okay? Now you won't have brewies and thrills uh, issues with this whole peritoneal dialysis stuff. You won't have it, okay? It's really hemodialysis, all right? Now, so let's think about those two, shall we? Peritoneal dialysis is done in the home. So my father chose to do that for years, and he did until he got peritonitis. Number one complication, peritonitis. You don't even qualify for peritoneal dialysis unless a family member, your spouse, your kid, somebody, signs that they will be responsible to do it if you can't. So both of you go through intense training. So nurses came to dad's house, they taught his wife, they did all this stuff. So you have to have someone signing on. Peritoneal dialysis is wonderful for the time frame it's done, but the way I understand it from all the doctors I've talked to is everyone eventually gets peritonitis. Now, peritonitis can be life-threatening because it can lead to sepsis. Why? Because peritonitis is GI. What do we teach you? All of GI is dirty. So if you were to become septic from the E. coli and everything else, oh my God, so we don't play with no damn peritonitis. How would you know your patient had peritonitis? What would you see? Cloudy. cloudy fluid. Remember my rule. If it comes out of the human body cloudy, it's infected. If it comes up from pharmacy cloudy, it's contaminated or it's in pH. So this patient that gets peritonitis, they're gonna have cloudy fluid. The fluid that comes out of the patient is called effluent. Okay, effluent, that's what it's called, effluent. So your patient, my dad, is getting supplies sent to the house. The supplies that are sent to the house is called dialysate. He is going to sit down in a lounge chair, positioning matters here, He's going to sit down in the lounge chair. He's going to fill his belly up with dialysate, about 2,000 cc's of whatever. And when he does that, he's going to let it sit. This is called dwell time. Now, I know on UWorld they had dwell time, half hour. That's for that patient. Dwell time is determined by the physician. It could be four hours. It could be all night long. If you go to sleep with the dialysate inside of your peritoneal cavity, which lots of people should do, and then they wake up and empty it, boom, your dwell time is about eight hours. Dwell time simply means how long did it sit? And it can just sit, it's no biggie, 
okay? Now, it acts like an artificial kidney. You needed to know it's hypertonic. Dialysate is hypertonic. Sterile technique must be done. If someone's helping them, the husband, the wife, both must have on a mask and a cap. If you're doing it at the hospital with your patient, the patient and the nurse must have a mask and a cap. Sterile technique, aseptic technique, right? You gotta know the other words, all right? Okay, so you're filling up with your dialysate you're allowing it to dwell inside of you for however long the doctor ordered and then you are draining into the bathtub or a bucket bucket usually because you're sitting in a lounge chair you're draining this fluid and it's called effluent now that effluent what color should it be jessica um, should it be clear? just plain old clear or should it be colored well, what color what color Should it be pink or tan or red or yellow or brown or what color should it be? Maybe yellow. You want it to be yellow? Do you agree with her, Rhonda? No. Why? What color would you like it to be? Um, tan, red, pink, yellow, brown. You want it pink? What color should it be, Sheba? You like pink or yellow or another color? Okay, we're gonna do some Crayola up in this motherfucker. I'm gonna ask Metcalf. What color you want, baby? Which crayon? Um, tan. Tan. What you working with, Felicia? <laughs> Yellow. What you got, Josh? Pink. Pink. What you working with, Dariana? Yellow. Okay, now listen. What the hell? <laughs> you got rid of urine. Urine is yellow. Here's what you teach your patient. Teach your patient that dialysis removes urine out of blood. Because before you had it, your urine was in your blood. That's what you better teach them. So since it's removing urine out of the blood, then it better be clear yellow. It may even be more pale, whatever. It's urine, okay? Keep that in mind. It ain't pink, last I checked. Unless your pee is pink, then you need to holler back at me on the break. Red, hell to the no. Tan, oh shit. Literally, you shit. Okay, so there's some perforation. Okay? So if you have pink, pink means the patient, if they're a man, there is a small tear or perforation. If it's a lady, maybe they're on their period. You better ask. If it's red, oh, well, you know what that means, right? If it's brown, oh, that means that there's also some type of contamination with stool. There must be a little tear in there somewhere. Poop is getting through. Cloudy means infected. You feel me on this? Hope so. Hope so. This shit is hard. Okay? Now, so. If you put the dialysate in and you get 2,000 cc's that you were ordered to put inside, what should it be when you drain the effluent? How many cc's? Hello? 2,000? Everybody cool? Darnita, you cool? If you put 2,000 in, should you get 2,000 out? No. You should get more. Yeah. Because you should get the 2,000 that you put in plus all the fluid from the body that you put it in there for. Might want to know that. Okay. Know the terms. Dialysate, dwell, effluent. Know the colors, know the amount. Kind of important. Okay? All right. So let's look at what this poor little lady is suffering with. We 